Good evening and welcome to this Brookings Doha Centre event. My name is Joanna Gajaroska. I'm delighted and honoured to be here for this uh, discussion entitled Lessons from the 2019 Asian Cup, Sports, Globalisation and Politics in the Arab World. Now, of course, the old saying is that sports and politics shouldn't mix, but every day in my job as a sports journalist for Al Jazeera English, I find those two issues collide and, of course, we get excellent stories from that. For example, the Gulf crisis of 2017 overshadowed the Asian Cup and it played out to a global audience, thanks to the international media largely, I think, <laughs> especially as Qatar went on to become the champions of the event. Now Qatar is once again the center of attention as it prepares to host the FIFA World Cup in 2022. And there's discussions at the high level happening right now about whether this tournament should be expanded to 48 teams. Now, if that should happen, and FIFA's president Gianni Infantino is very keen on that, then Qatar would likely have to share that event with perhaps Oman or Kuwait. Could that even happen? Uh, where would that leave the political landscape, and would it help or hinder a resolution to the Gulf crisis? Well, for all of those stories and to talk a little bit more about these issues, uh, we have three panelists joining me here this evening. James Dorsey to my left is a senior fellow at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at Singapore's Nanyang Technological University. And he's also the author of the blog, The Turbulent World of Middle East Soccer. <laughs> to the left of James, we have Dr. Ahmed Alamadi. He's the Dean of the College of Education at Qatar University. Dr. Alamadi is an associate professor of sports management and wrote a book entitled Leadership in Sport. He's also the Secretary General of Al Arabi Sports Club and Chair of the Board of Trustees at Aspire Academy. And to the left of Dr. Alamadi, we have Dr. Mahara, <coughs> is, who is the Director of Sports Science Program at the College of Arts and Scientist, uh, Sciences of Qatar University. Dr. Amara has a number of publications on sport, business, culture, politics, and society in the Arab region. So we'll start with some opening comments from our panelists, and then we'll take some questions. We'll start with James Dorsey, who will be speaking to us about the history of sport in this region and how divisive it can be. Well, thank you very much. And it's a delight to be back in uh, Doha, and I'm a delight to be back at Brookings. And I want to thank uh, Brookings and Tariq, but also Kais for the incredible warm welcome and the, and the invitation that they've extended. Having said that, I hate to be a game spoiler at the outset, but I think that there is a false assumption underlying the question that, uh, or the core question that's being posed at this discussion, namely the role of football in the formation of national identity as well as whether or not football can play a role in international integ uh, integration. The false assumption is that football has the potential, potential to be a driver, that it can spark or shape developments. There's a second false assumption, and that is that sports in general, and football in particular, has the power to build bridges. The assertion is, if foes play football, you build bridges. It's a notion that FIFA President Gianni Infantino at the moment is putting forward with his proposal to expand uh, the number of teams playing in Qatar and with that expand the number of countries that would be hosting the, um, the World Cup in 2022 and that that would help resolve or could help resolve the Gulf crisis. In my mind, nothing is further from the truth. In fact, I would argue that football is an aggressive sport. It's about conquering the other half of the field. Its allegiances are tribal in nature, and it more often divides than the, it unites. You know, one starting point of the Yugoslav wars in the 1990s was the Croatian-Serbian football match. In conflict situations, football more often than not offers up an additional battlefield, whether that is the 2022 World Cup or this year's Asian Cup against the backdrop of the rift in the Gulf or the lay of the Palestinian-Israeli landscape 
or the rise of racist and discriminatory attitudes that we've been seeing in Europe. Fact of the matter is, sports like ping pong in Richard Nixon's 1972 rapprochement with China, or what we saw with the recent Olympics in Korea, is a tool, it's not a driver. It's a useful tool when an environment exists in which key political players are pursuing goals that involve the building of bridges and the narrowing of differences. In the absence of that environment, created by political players, not by sports players, the impact of a football match is temporary relief, a blip on an otherwise very bleak landscape. And the proof is in the pudding. Think back of the Christmas 1914 football match between the, the Brits and the Germans, or the 2007 Iraqi victory in um, the Asian football camp. 2014, you had a 24-hour ceasefire, and then you had four years of massive killing and millions of dead. 2007, everybody was on the streets of Baghdad and other Iraqi cities. The game itself was a classic, and I don't remember the sequence, but whatever it was, it was a Shiite giving a ball to a Sunni and a Kurd who, st who, st who strikes the goal or whatever it was. And 24 hours later, you were back to some of the worst sectarian violence that Iraq had seen. I would argue that the same is true for, for football's role in shaping or cementing national identity. In other words, football can be a rallying point for identity, but again, only if there is an environment that is conducive. The problem is that the formation of, of identity is often in opposition to, opposition to something, someone. That again is nowhere truer than in the Middle East and North Africa, where football has played and plays an important role in identity formations since it was first introduced to the region in the early, or late 19th century, early 20th century. And it is true today. If you start with today, Qatar has been in some, some ways an outlier by, pl by pl putting sports and, and the sports strategy and policy not only in terms of its soft power play or as a pillar of health policy, but also as a component of national identity. That element has been strengthened by the rift in the Gulf and, of course, bolstered by the Asian Cup victory. It's happening in a context in which Qatar no longer operates on the notion that Gulf states have to hang together. Today, it's hanging on its own in a conflict with three of its neighbors. Football's role in identity formation in the Middle East and North Africa was often because it was a battlefield, a battlefield for identity that was part of a larger or larger political struggles. Clubs were often formed for that very reason. Take the examples of Al Ahli and Zamalek in Egypt, or the clubs in Algeria, and Mahfoud can speak to that far better than I can, as part of an anti colonial struggle against the French. Or the role of sports and football in the formation of Turkish and Iranian identity, where rulers saw it as a first step towards the formation of a defense force. It was an important identity formation in Jewish nationalism, as well as in Palestinian nationalism opposed to Zionist immigration. And finally, football was important in the shaping of ethnic identities, whether, for example, Berbers, Kurds, East Bank Jordanians, and Jordanian Palestinians. In other words, football, football was both inclusive in the sense of contributing to a formation of uh, a collective identity, but it was also divisive because that identity was at the same time exclusionary and opposed to another. The long and short of all of this is that football is malleable. What impact it has and what the fallout is is dependent on forces beyond its control. It is dependent on the environment shaped by political and social forces. Football is a tool that in a sense is agnostic in purpose. It's not a driver or an independent actor. Thank you.
James Dorsey, thank you very much. So, football at all, uh, a tribal battlefield, <coughs> temporary relief for its fans. Well, let's move on to Dr. Ahmed Alamadi, who will address the issue of sport and soft power again, uh, and how it can help build a community. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tariq Youssef and uh, Mr. Qais Sharif for this opportunity uh, to have a guest in this event. Uh, I'll be talking briefly about uh, just the following points. Community building, social inclusion, impact of sports and influence of sports, and uh, sports as a soft power. Uh, maybe to some extent I agree with uh, Mr. Dorsey, what he's, I think, giving very gloomy picture here today <laughs> about sports. I'm actually an optimist. <laughs> Uh, I think also most of what he has said, I think uh, it's, it's not unified, doesn't apply to all regions. It differs from place to place as well, I believe. It's not just one size fits all, I think. Uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, uh, nation building, I think uh, the achievement of uh, Asian Cup here in Qatar was, uh, you know, one of its kind into this region. And uh, this had a very uh, great opportunity for Qataris to get together. Uh, and it, it, it didn't bring joy just to Qataris, as we have seen in TVs as well. We see many Arab countries celebrated this uh, achievement, whether it was in Gaza, in uh, Jordan, in Morocco, many other places. Maybe this part of this was has to do with the politics as well aside, was because of uh, the Arab Spring didn't bring any good thing to, to Arabs. This was a way as a hope that through football we might do something or cheer or be hopeful. This, I think, was one way of, of showing these people they were very joyful and, and very happy for this achievement. I think also this brings, uh, this kind of achievement brings uh, cohesiveness and, and uh, empower the national identity as well. Even as Jim said, is a temporary, but for a while at least, you know, I, I, I really wanted to give the same example what happened in Iraq in 2007. As you have seen, you know, they were in 2003, big war there, and uh, uh, ethnic clinch and, and everything we have seen there. But when they achieved this in 2007, all Kurd, Arab, uh, Shia, Sunnah, all of them, they got together and they were very happy for this big edge. I think unified them for a while, maybe temporary, but at least they had it for a while as well. Also, I think this kind of achievement, achievement sorry, it it's, uh, helps in community building as well. Uh, if you have seen uh, in 1995 Rugby World Cup in South Africa and how they were divided, white and blacks, uh, then we have seen, you know, by uh, bringing or, or achieving this uh, how Nelson Mandela has a great uh, role into that from the beginning and even extended into the World Cup 2010. He tried to unify the South African. And they had kind of belongings only, you know, and, and uh, it helped them, this dividedness between these two communities and uh, through sports as well, like rugby. They, they did something very good, I think. And uh, still maybe... The, they are, uh, you know, reaping the fruit of, of this up to now, the South African, especially with the rugby team. Before, like, uh, before 95, I rarely find, for example, a black player playing with them. But now, very often, see more black and youngsters coming to this game. And this is kind of, you know, representing how sports can bring people together, despite of their ethnicity and... Uh, uh, any group they come from. Also, sport as uh, uh, social inclusion, it might not apply too much to Qatar or the Gulf, but I think it's a great tool for the immigrants and minorities. You know, I think one of the best tools, they use it even in the camps, where are the problem. Usually they go penetrated through sports to include these minorities and migrants, people to come and uh, introduce them to the new culture and new communities. This is, I think, very good point that will help. Uh, also, uh, sports as international integration and a global influence. I think, uh, to give an example, uh, for Qatar to host this mega event, 
you know, Qatar before 2010, I think most of Europeans, they didn't know where is Qatar or what is Qatar. The only thing they knew about Qatar was Al Jazeera, mm. if you remember. But by hosting this now, a lot of people also, we start to having even uh, the, the tourism coming to Qatar for sports, using some, either coming watching or using like golf courses and other things, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think global influence using the sport as well, this is very great way. We have seen, uh, like you give uh, examples, I think, you know, uh, especially during the conflicts, as you said, Dorsey, is that uh, if you remember the ping pong policy, for example, between America and China, uh, the big uh, uh, fight was a sanction against Iran, and then how they win their football team to uh, America, they played with the American, and you know, how, how sports, I always, like I told you earlier, I put it in this way, is like a cream who treats the wound, the wound that it comes from the politics or politicians, or I consider them the most dirty people, most dirtiest people on this planet always trying to divide people. But I think in a way, sport is trying to bring them together. A sport as well as a soft power, I think Qatar, uh, like Dorsey mentioned, uh, has in its strategy vision from 2008 that Qatar, uh, sport is the, one of the four main pillars in our strategy. And, and it, the, the achievement wasn't a sudden or out of nowhere. Uh, this was well planned for these juniors. They, you know, since they were very, around 10, nine years old, they took them into the Spire Academy, uh, trained them for a while. I am a member of Spire Academy. Maybe, you know, during some time I was at conflict with the people there. Why these people going there, you know, on their own, these kids, and uh, at the expense of their studies and their future. But it turned to be by, you know, uh, uh, getting this achievement, I think they were right in a way. That I changed in my mind in many things with the Spire Academy as well. But I think uh, uh, this kind of achievement, uh, honestly, you know, like Qatar is a very tiny country. Very important for Qatar uh, to use the sport as a soft power uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, tell about herself, what is Qatar, what we are doing. And as Dorsey said, it's not just about the sport. I use a term, I called it, you know, Qatar from development of a sport to development through sports. And this is true. Qatar now using a sport, not just for the sake of improving sports only, but for the sake of other sectors like health, economy, uh, even education. To give you an example, if you see a Khalifa Stadium, for example, now, uh, this is, we signed an agreement, Qatar University with 2022 Delivery and Legacy, and Aspire uh, uh, Zone, and Qatar Football Association. Some of the rooms in the Khalifa Stadium being assigned as a classes for uh, students who specialize in physical education and sports science. Uh, and and I, I assure you that Qatar for sure won't live like other countries when they used to host this mega event, a white elephant. Qatar promised that most of these stadiums be dismantled like she's been given as a gift to other undeveloped countries or to developing countries. And, and uh, bear in mind that even some clubs still they don't have their own stadiums. So I don't think Qatar will leave anything behind. And on top of that, I know that Qatar also hoping again to host the Olympics again. They're gonna bid for it again and hopefully gonna get it if we hopefully be successful in hosting the FIFA World Cup 2022. And I'm sure of that. Inshallah will be one of the best uh, uh, event. Finally, media coverage, like uh, Dorsey said, is divided us terribly in this region. But uh, I think uh, we tried as, as uh, our media, local media, not Al Jazeera, but like Al Qas and, and the rest we were following, they tried to be very polite, very honest, but the formal media and social media 
of especially UAE, unfortunately, they were attacking Qatar in all levels, from the leaders, governments, people, everything. And you have seen this, the worst scenario, people, you know, the, uh, uh, throwing uh, their shoes and, uh, you know, they said, I don't know if I have it here, it was nice, one of the articles was about the soul. They said they lost their soul, but the soul was in two meanings, this, their soul and their soul. You know, they weren't polite at all. But to my, you know, I was amazed that how come the Asian Federation only fined UAE $150,000 and too much ban? This is unbelievable. I mean, even now if you've seen when the rights of Al Jazeera to broadcast, they breached that one, UAE, and especially Saudi Arabia by AFC. And I don't know what it's going to do. And this has to do, again, like Dorsey said, there is, we cannot at all divide politics from sports, at all. It goes hand in hand, and I think the overhand is, comes to politics when it comes to sport. For example, where, where to participate or, or agreement to participate comes from the, the government of the countries. You know, we have seen like uh, what happened Olympics in Moscow, later on in Los Angeles. It's all been forbidden by the government. They didn't allow, allow the uh, uh, sportsmen to, to attend or to participate. So I think politics uh, playing a great ro role and this all sport big organization lying to everybody, honestly. You know, when it comes IOC or FIFA, it's all fake. And that's why we see a lot of corruption in this organization. And I think this is the time for us to stand and say enough is enough. We have to do something and stop them and bring sport, make it very ordinary and very small for just normal people to watch. Now one of the dilemmas now, you have to pay. You go a, a golf match or, or a rugby match, you have to pay yourself and your family around the $300. No one, not everyone can afford that. I think it should be a free of charge and should be very simple and all governments get out of it. Make it, this is sports for everyone, sports for all. Thank you very much. <coughs> Dr. Dr. Alamari, thank you very much. Yeah. A cream that treats the wound of sports. <laughs> I like that a lot. Thank you. Okay, well, let's move on now to Dr. Mahmoud Amara, who will discuss the position of Qatar in international football. Uh, thank you, first of all, for this opportunity, and I'm really glad to be here and talk about uh, our passion, which is uh, sport and, and football, and, and in the capital of sports, uh, Doha. And uh, my colleagues here, uh, Dr. James Torsi and uh, Dr. Ahmed Laimadi, I think they covered a lot uh, of uh, some of the aspects that I'm going to, to talk about, but I will try to be uh, very brief. Um, First, I think what uh, struck me is the, the context, the whole context that of the, around the victory of, the, of Qatar in the, the Asian uh, Cup. You know, it happens you know, in a specific political context of, you know, of uh, resil you know there was uh, tensions and, uh, and this, you know, during the, you know, uh, the ongoing uh, blockade that is happening. And we, had, you know, we have seen the national team going through uh, real challenges first, you know, uh, going to play for the the Golf Cup and where the performance wasn't very, very good. And at that time, they received many criticism and uh, there was instability as well with the, the management, with the, with the coaching staff, and having only few, t I mean, only little time, you know, to prepare themselves for this Asian Cup, and knowing that maybe there, you know, there will not be any Qatari uh, fans, you know, being able to to go and travel there and. Maybe they were not even sure how to prepare psychologically for it, uh, because you know even before the before the match, before the, the competition, there were even uh, the even the officials, you know, the you know from Qatar, they were having difficulties to reach out, you know, to the UAE. And the fact that the Asian Cup also is happening in the UAE, I, thought, I know is the best kind of scenario, you know. And then uh, I think maybe the Qataris when they went there, they they were less under less pressure. You know, then maybe the maybe the Emirates and the Saudis, where it was, you know, the, the competition became very very politicized in the meet in the media over there. That the players they were, I mean, I mean, focusing more on winning against Qatar rather than maybe winning the the title. 
and I think they put them in really under, under, uh, under pressure. And uh, you can see that the Qatari uh, team was uh, building a really nice momentum, you know, winning against all the, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the Saudi and then the UAE and then uh, reaching uh, the final. And uh, I, was, I was watching the, the final in the shopping mall here. I wanted to be, this is why, why I came to, to Qatar in 2015, because I wanted to be part of this experience of the experience of the, of, 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 you know, the building up toward the FIFA World Cup 2022 and living the experience from within in Qatar. And uh, uh, it was, yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's uh, as, as, as a performance. And as Dr. Ahmed Al-Imadi said, this is not only performance for Qatar, but for the whole uh, Arab world. And that's what Qatar was saying in terms of when uh, it bid for the the World Cup, that the World Cup is not only for, the, for, the, for Qatar, but for the whole region. And this has, you know, the victory represented very well that, that kind of dimension of the, uh, of the performance of, uh, of Qatar in the Asian uh, uh, Cup. And of course, I mean, when it comes to learning, what, are the, what we can learn from it, uh, from a policy point of view, uh, uh, as Dr. Ahmadi was saying, you know, uh, just said that but the, the, the impact of the elite sport development pathways that is started uh, you know, a few years ago, you know, even before uh, Qatar bid for the, the FIFA World Cup, I will say with the Asian Cup uh, being the really uh, a moment, key moment in terms of the development of sports in Qatar with uh, the launch of Aspire, Aspire Academy, Aspitar, and, uh, you know, with all the, the and also the, the development of the elite sport development pathway, and they have many uh, schemes. And so you can see that there was a, a continuity in terms of uh, Everything to do with the, you know, the scouting of the, the, the players, bringing those, those players all together in Aspire Academy, forming this uh, really a strong uh, group, integrating them into the different clubs, uh, either uh, within the, the, the local league, domestic league, but even giving those, some of the players opportunity as well to have some experience in playing uh, abroad, you know, with Aspire, you know, joining uh, forces with uh, some clubs in Belgium. And so you can see that there was a strategy happening. Uh, also, in terms of uh, sports science provision, that we need to, I think it's, Qatar is unique of having, an, you know, an important mass of scientists, sports scientists, you know, in Qatar, you know, working. I mean, I mean of course, we have Aspitar, we have Qatar University, and the sports science, science provision in terms of helping the players with, uh, with their uh, uh, preventing injuries, with the recoveries from injuries, uh, in terms of uh, all the research that has been doing. Uh, that have uh, been published around, uh, you know, the heat and how you, you know, how the players and the, can adopt and div, you know the, uh, the, their, their skills while uh, you know um, adapting to the kind of the of the environments here. Uh, while at that time the, the thinking was that maybe the World Cup was going to be in the summer, but now it's going to be uh, in the winter. So yeah, the importance of elite sport uh, development, and I think Qatar is building some uh, unique uh, model that maybe. Uh, other nations in the Arab world will look at it as ah maybe that's something that we can uh, apply and of course I mean Qatar is, has learned as well from other uh, countries in the Arab world I'm talking I mean like mean, Tunisia and others they had some kind of elite sport development system but I think Qatar has had the means as well the financial means to bring all the best you know into in Qatar and helping in this so this is the elite sport development uh, but of course it's not ideal it's not there are still some challenges. Um, I will conclude with those challenges at the end. But so that's the first thing: elite sport development. The other thing is the football culture in the, the country. There have been many criticism about Qatar when first Qatar won the bid. That there was no football culture. Look at the the stadium. There are no spectators. How is Qatar credible as a nation to to organize this mega sport event? Being the first Arab country to organize mega sport events. And I think that. This victory, I mean, this performance came in the right time, four years before the World Cup, and of course, this change completely the view of uh, I mean, people that can say, ah, oh, yeah, there's, they are hosting the games, they are hosting these um, big events, but also there is a, a football, a national team uh, that is doing very well. And I think this gave a credibility for Qatar football-wise, in terms of its ranking, in terms of also going to the uh, Pan-American Cup, not as guest, no, but as a, you know, a credible contender, you know, going there. The other uh, thing that I learned from the, also being here and, and observing what happens is the, the mobilization of, the, of Qataris 
uh, and I mean, sorry, nationals and residents around this national team. Uh, and maybe, you know, when first Qatar won the bid, nobody could see the real impact of having this uh, FIFA World Cup being hosted here in Qatar. And people, their experience was about with construction. Ah, oh, I'm going to go to my work, and the construction, the roads changing. And so what's the impact of all these events that is happening to, to Qatar? And people, maybe they were not, not everybody maybe was uh, convinced about it. But I think with the, this performance, they could see that now they could see that, ah, in four years, there will be this really very important event that is coming here in, the, in, 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 in here in, in Qatar, and uh, or, or maybe I don't know whether it maybe it could be shared with other. But uh, they could see the the that ah, this is really important <coughs> events, not only if in terms from a sporting point of view, but for the nation in terms of national, in, in terms of its prestige, in terms of its position, in terms of its. Uh, uh, building a confidence, you know, uh, around the nation, uh, particularly in terms of uh, resilience, uh, in terms of, sorry, of, uh, of, uh, of tensions, so building resilience uh, in terms of tensions. Um, not everybody, of, 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 of course, there are still some challenges that maybe we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, uh, how you balance between having uh, importing players versus uh, developing domestic football is there, you know, is there a way to balance between the two? Because there, there have been also some, crit I mean, uh, criticism even in UAE and Saudi Arabia. They were saying this: maybe this is not the performance of you know, Qataris. This, those players are not the product of the uh, of the Qatar footballing uh, system. And so, how is there a way to, I mean, to reduce maybe the dependence of Qatar from, uh, um, you know, foreign imports and uh, while developing more uh, domestic uh, football. Maybe, but then the other uh, way to put it as well, if thanks to those imports of those players who are coming to the, the, the local you know, uh, league, then maybe you have some players now are reaching to the uh, kind of the international uh, uh, level. And you can see uh, that uh, first when f uh, Qatar started developing uh, its football uh, system, most of the players who were coming were retired players, I mean, good players, but they were retired. But we have seen the last few years that their age is going a little bit, uh, you know, they are, you know, we have young players, you know, even in the national teams, like I'm talking about Baghdad, in the Baghdad, yeah, in the set, is one of the top scorers. He's playing in the national team, the Algerian national team, and he's playing here in, uh, uh, in Qatar. And playing in Qatar didn't prevent him uh, from not being in the, uh, selected in the Algerian national team. So, yeah, but how to balance between the, this naturalization versus uh, developing a, a domestic uh, football? Uh, and also, um, the, so that we have also some challenges within the league as, itself. Only few clubs are dominating the league. Uh, is this good in the long term in terms of sustainability? Uh, Dhail, and we have only few, Dhail, Asad, and Darian. Of course, those, uh, those clubs, because they have now strong teams, now they are going as well to the Asian Champions League, so maybe that's also uh, it has some benefits into the yeah. So that some challenges, maybe we can have time to to talk about them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahfoud Amara. Um, I will open it to questions from the floor in a moment, but I'd really like to address the panelists uh, for a few minutes myself and ad and address the elephant in the room. This. 48 team World Cup that's being discussed right now. I'd like to start with James Dorsey. Why is FIFA so keen to make it a 48 team World Cup in Qatar when they already have one in 2026? Do you think it's going to happen? I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I think the galleries have played it very smart. They've, you know, if you look at gallery communications policy and public relations policy from the moment that they won the bid in 2010, the gutteries have come a long way. And one of the things that they've learned is it's better to give a positive answer rather than a negative answer, even if you don't intend to do it. And so the gutteries have not excluded formally an expansion, but they don't really want it. Why is FIFA doing this? I think for two reasons. One is, you know, if one looks at the, uh, the FIFA report that Associated Press uh, uh, 
uh, uh, published last week, $400 million is $400 million. And uh, if Gianni Infantino is about anything, it's about dollars. Exactly. Uh, but having said that, I, I personally also feel that if you look at how FIFA throughout the last, uh, whatever it is, 18, 20 months, since the, um, the, gulf, the rift in the Gulf uh, exploded, Increasingly, he's been doing Saudi and UAE bidding. And again, it's about money, $25 billion. You know, the SoftBank bid. And Dr. Alamari, your point of view on this? Yeah, I, I uh, you know, uh, I don't think it's going to be 48, but even 32, I'm against it. I, in my belief, World Cup it should be about the best teams, you, you know, they come and, and see. I, I, before it used to be 16 teams. I think this is the best. To have 32, you know, who's going to just raise your hand, please? You watch usually the first round of the World Cup. It's shamble mumble, just, you know, teams you never heard of the names. They come and, and play. And as Dorsey says, it's about money and multinational corporations who are behind these entities like FIFA or IOC. They are running the show behind. And, and they don't care about whether you like it, you will be satisfied about it, you will enjoy it. They don't care. Is the dollar, the green thing, they're looking after. This is my opinion, and, and I think having whether now they're gonna share it with us or not, then I don't know what is the, they're gonna put as uh, measures now, the FIFA, if let's say they're gonna give it to Bahrain and uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia, are they gonna get the blockade out of this or, or with the blockade on top of that? I'm sure Qatar not gonna agree with that, you know? whether they, they impose certain things on them in order to be part of this event or not, I'm not sure. But I think, in my opinion, it will stay in Qatar. This is my expectation. And you mentioned in your opening comments there that Qatar faced a lot of criticism during the Asian Cup in terms of the team that was actually playing at the Asian Cup. Mm -hmm. um, one of the tweets that I received when we were covering the Asian Cup at the, at, for Al Jazeera was that it was a cocktail team with cocktail fans. There's no problem. Look at the French team <laughs> who, who got the World Cup. Who originally was the French? Just let me know. Except the coach. This was the World Cup and the France with millions. <laughs> And despite of this, this is not true. Who just mentioned one player, we brought him, used to play in the league outside in his country. Just mentioned one out of 22 players. Mm -hmm. I challenge anyone. All of them being raised here and they played here, they've been trained in Qatar. And, and media, especially those people, you know, by all means they're gonna play. The other day we have seen the BBC, I don't know who was behind it, tens of millions. They said Qatar tried to bribe to host the, and there is nothing. You know, uh, the report by FIFA says uh, Qatar has a clear file. So if he has anything, you know, just come and show it to us. Well, where does the country draw a line then when it comes to selecting players for the national team? I uh, kind of agree with uh, Mahfouz, is that, you know, uh, bear in mind, Qatar is a very small country. We are around 300,000 citizens. And to bring, we have 27 uh, federations. And, and uh, we have multi-levels from juniors starting from eight, nine years old till first team. So it's very difficult to produce only Qataris as a talent. But we don't mind being who been born here or being raised here, like any other countries. Like uh, to give you an example, the Somali guy marathon in, 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 uh, in England, who won uh, the marathon. Is he a Briton? Is he British? No, he, he brought, came from Somalia, represented, and no one, nobody said anything. No one criticized Ameri uh, England or America or France, but only Qatar because it's a very small country, very tiny, everyone, and trying to bribe Qatar, honestly. Mm -hmm. The journalists, the countries, <coughs> trying to bribe Qatar by uh, forcing. But Qatar, I, I think now it's the time to stand. I think Qatar won't listen to them, won't go that you know, to try to do anything. Qatar has all rights now, and Qatar is going to deliver the most beautiful World Cup you will ever see. This is my expectation. Dr. Mara, you wanted to add something to that? No, it's just for the 48 uh, nations. You know, it's kind of interesting because I'm from Africa, you know, and uh, in Africa, we only have five teams going to the World Cup, and we used to have only two and then five. 
And, you know, you have great nations, football nations, who, you know, cannot go there, just, you know, they qualify to the World Cup because there are only few seats. And we know what happens, you know, few, you know, in 2010, Algeria, Egypt. It was like nearly a war, you know, it's just uh, for the, uh, the whole thing becomes uh, who is going to represent the Arab world in the World Cup? Who is going to represent which Arab nations should go, you know, from Africa? So having 48, this will give more opportunities for at least for some uh, continents like uh, Africa or other continent, big uh, continents, you know, to to have more chances to, you know, uh, of a better representation uh, in the World Cup. And it wasn't fair why Europe will get more. Uh, uh, nations uh, qualifying, and uh, while I mean, few from other continents. Of course, there is the, the, the aspect around finance and the money. You know, more in terms of broadcasting rights, more contracts, and but maybe it's better share as well of this money that is coming to FIFA to other uh, the 48 nations that are qualifying. Uh, so, yeah. So it's. Uh, what I was, uh, there was another. Uh, I forgot uh, well, the line of uh, argument. I will come back to okay, it. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, well, James Orsi, you wanted to have some. I, I just wanted to add one point with regard to the expansion of the number of teams, and, mm -hmm. and that there is the political aspect of it. The Emiratis, in my mind, far more than the Saudis, are dead set on undermining, to whatever degree they can, the. Um, the benefit that Qatar may derive from the World Cup. My guess is that by now they're slowly coming to the conclusion that depriving Qatar of the hosting rights isn't going to happen. So if Qatar cannot, is not capable of hosting it and has to share, that at least is a one, one step forward from their point of view. There's also in my mind a second problem, and that is if the boycott were to continue till 2022, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Egyptians, the Bahrainis have a problem. Because for the first time you have a major sporting event in the Middle East, for the first time you have it in a neighboring country, in a soccer crazy part of the world, and your fans can't go there. So they're going to have a dilemma. You know, they're either going to have a domestic problem. I think technically, can they go here rather than... I'm not sure that legally, mm. if you're an Emirati, you can today travel to Doha. Uh -huh. mm. So they've got a problem, which is either they've got a domestic problem because a lot of people are going to be upset, even more so if their national teams qualify for the World Cup, or they've got to breach their own boycott. <clears throat> so in that sense, you could argue that having an X number of games in whatever neighboring country, Kuwait or Oman, may be a band-aid, or, or, or so, at least a partial solution to that problem. OK, mm -hmm. good. Well, I'd like to take some questions now from the audience. Has anyone got a question for our panelists? Sir, we'll just wait for a microphone for you. I can't hear my uh, would, If you could just uh, give us an introduction of who you are and uh, let us know your question. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, um, I'm Darush Al Hamadi from Qatar University. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Brookings for you know hosting and arranging this, and all the panelists for their nice talk. I have actually, uh, if if we just imagine for a second that on the day that Qatar played the UAE in the Asian Cup, if we imagine for a second on that day somebody actually out of the planet from Mars just came in and actually saw the game against. UAE against uh, uh, Korea, and then three days later, UAE against Qatar, I think they must have found that something is strange. This cannot be right, you know? And they, they didn't have, that the Martian has no clue about the, the politics of the region. He's just watching and say, well, there's something going on. And I always think that actually, unfortunately, sports, regardless whether it is football, of course, football because it is the most you know, popular sports in the world that's watched by millions and millions and millions. So it's more so in football than in, in tennis or in ping pong and, or in other sports. But it's, football unfortunately becomes the platform or a stage where actually uh, the conf political conflict manifests itself very clearly. And I totally agree with James that actually uh, sports is a victim of politics. 
It's always actually, it has no say of its own in, in, in real sense. And it's always actually been driven by other forces, which is primarily politics. So if the, 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 the politics between the different parties is, is good, then it, it lacks fine, I mean. And sometimes we also find that it looks like a battlefield, an actual battlefield. I mean, if you all recall in 1994, the World Cup in America, when Iranian played the, uh, the USA, the people, the players exchange flower, the only match that actually they exchange all the 22 players on the pitch, each, each one had the bouquet and give it to the other party. It was good to start. But I'd like actually, if anybody actually saw what actually Iranian wrote in the newspaper the day that they won, that actually this is the battle we won. Mm -hmm. So it was actually a, a manifestation, a political manifestation. It's not, the, it's not a football game anymore. It becomes more of what we call it, a pride of nations that is involved. And I think this is very important. And because actually so much money now is involved in, poli in, in sports, I find no way that actually it becomes the popular that we all wish. I mean, I, Ahmed is my brother, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wishful thinking. It will never happen. Now, if we look at, for example, the amount of money that is involved in, in football, in, in Champions League or in, in the leagues, and it's, it's, you're talking about trillions of, of dollars. There's no way that actually even people who run these sports are prepared to let it go and actually just make it for fun. It's no way. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the gentleman in the middle there with his hand up, please. Uh, just there in the middle. Oh, OK, this gentleman over here with the glasses. I did see you earlier. So we'll start with you, and then we'll move on. Yes. Hi, I'm Hairu Logo Kandam from Northwestern University here in Qatar. And thanks to all the speakers uh, for a very insightful and provocative uh, um, words and presentation. Um, uh, just a reflection, which I would like to hear their thoughts on it. Um, I, the, wor the Greeks had this word called entilikia, which meant that something had the potential to be something very big, but it never achieved that. And that was applied to a particular school of, of thought in, in Greece. And what I'm thinking is that we are in, in front of, the, of a, we are in the danger in Qatar of, of an intelikia. And, I, and somebody mentioned about the fact that Qatar is donating the, the, the stadiums to uh, undeveloped country, uh, countries to be developed uh, as, a le as part of the legacy. But what, what is coming with that? And that's where I think Qatar has a great opportunity in terms of becoming a center of reference in terms of knowledge, of providing not only the stadiums, but building up capability. That's really how Qatar can build, in my opinion, uh, a, a strong legacy as a, in terms of using uh, sports as soft power. Not only in terms of seeing, being seen and being perceived as a country that donates resources and money, but also as a country that is able to build capability and transfer knowledge. In the same way we see today countries like the United States or Europe. Uh, so a, a place in which knowledge about sports is created and knowledge about sports can help build capability. That's the way it's going to really break, break any blockades and barriers in the, in the region, becoming that center of sports knowledge and sports transfer there. I think that was a point, actually, that was made by Mahfoud Mara, but James Dorsey, you'd like to make a point? Well, two things. I just want to, one remark in response to the, the mm. first speaker. I like the, um, the phrasing a vic that sports is the victim. The only thing that I would add to that is it's a very willing victim at the governance level. The other, the other very brief point I, I'd make is that the experience of the Qatar the UAE match during the Asian Cup may have been something of a first in the Gulf. It's not something of a, of a first in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You look at matches in Egypt, Ahli Zamalek or Ahli Port Said. Egypt, Egypt. You look at you know, matches between uh, that Beitar Jerusalem plays, um, I now forget the name of the team, it's, uh, but it doesn't really matter. But it's that even worse than what you saw. Um, go back to Faisali and Al-Wahda and Jordan. And we could go down the line. 
in terms of, I don't see sports, you know, and, and whatever success the gutter may or may not have with the hosting of the World Cup and with the development of a sports sector, that that's going to be what's going to break the boycott. It's not. I think, in fact, it's totally irrelevant to that. However, what I would say is the one thing that Qatar has done, in, uh, particularly in comparison to other states in the region that dabble in sports in various different ways, Qatar has been very strategic about it. And it's not just the issue of national identity. Uh -huh. Most countries develop a sports sector, so you know, a sports industry, uh, sports medicine, security, whatever it may be, over decades. And Qatar has, is trying to do that in a way that really, maybe only Saudi Arabia to some degree, but not even to that extent. Most of, I mean, if you look at Emirati, Bahraini uh, sports strategy in terms of soft power, it's hosting matches, it's hosting uh, tournaments. It's trying to get, particularly in the UAE case, federations to move their headquarters. It's not a really a building a strategic fundamental uh, building blocks of an industry. Now, that, you know, God has made achievements in that, but you don't do that overnight. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of lessons, sure, that Gata will learn from uh, the experience of the 2022 World Cup. But again, you don't become the hub overnight. So I think one also has to manage expectations. I just I want to add a point I think I missed, which was, uh, didn't elaborate on it. I think one also of the main reason of hosting this by Qatar, this mega event, is that I, I heard even the Amir at that time, Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa, mentioned himself on that day when they announced, uh, is that we're going to change the stereotype about the culture, about our culture as an Arab. Mm. You know, this is a big, big point, I think, for us to raise here because many, especially Westerners, they have negative stereotype about our culture, about our, uh, as an Arab in general. I think this, by hosting this event, it's a great opportunity for us to showcase our culture, to show them who are the Arabs. We have we are not just Bedouin. We have heritage, we have culture, we have deep history. Uh, this is a great opportunity, not just for Qataris. I'm sure all representative of all Arab nations will be here presenting something as a culture, either singing or uh, you know, any other ways of, of showcasing their culture. This is one thing. Uh, other point is that I mentioned that it's not uh, you know, Qatar just moving from developing of a sport to de de developing uh, through the sport is that I have last slide is used to be, <laughs> I thought is presentation. But to give you an example, you know, who hosted before us the World Cup, like Russia, I started with Russia was, <coughs> the, it cost them 11.6 billion. Uh, Brazil, 15 billion. Uh, Russia, uh, our, uh, South Africa was, uh, uh, three to five billion. But Qatar, the cost was huge, 220 billion. But only eight to 15 billion went for the venues. The rest was for the infrastructure. And this is how you mentioned, Dorsey, is, is Qatar has a vision, a strategy. Through sports, we can develop our country. And all this, you know, highways you see, all these infrastructures, if, if you didn't have a chance to host the World Cup, I think that money would have gone somewhere else. Yeah, this is my two points. Thank okay, you. Wonderful. Thank you. <coughs> Can I take a question from this gentleman here on the third row in the grey jacket? He's been watching <coughs> patiently. Yes, you, sir. Uh, you, sir. Yes, with the moustache. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Paulino Robles Hill. I'm from Mexico. I do my PhD in Gulf Studies in Qatar University. Oh. And the topic I'm researching on is the challenges of the first World Cup in the Muslim world. So I'm very happy to, to be here. Um, this World Cup is unique, 2022. Why? Because it's been, by the time we reached 2022, 
it's been already 12 years of highly politicized World Cup. This has never happened before. This is unique. Mm -hmm. And if football is an additional battlefield and not a peace broker, and if football is an enhancer of the sentiments, I wonder what would happen if the environment of this tough neighborhood would be not really friendly by 2022. What would the World Cup be like? In other words, soft power has a counter concept, which is soft disempowerment. Mm -hmm. And there are some authors that have been working for this concept of soft disempowerment. The concrete and precise question would be, what are the chances, if we make a prospect now, that the 2022 World Cup will be actually a failure for Qatar? A high disempowerment, a terrible bet. Because, as we are seeing now, all these lobbyers, there are many lobbyers, even our neighbors here, many interests in making 2022 a failure. And I'm not talking only about geopolitics, but also about Islam. Many people will be very happy to know and to create that the first World Cup in the Muslim world was not successful. And increasingly, as we approach 2022, things are not getting better, things are going worse. So what are the risks of disempowerment for Qatar hosting the 2022 World Cup if football is an extension of the battlefield? Thank you. Thank you, good question. What um, I, will, I mean, I, I always like to be, to, to be hopeful and, and to see the world. And, and the, but uh, Qatar hosted the, the, Asian, the Asian Games. Those were the second biggest events after the Olympics in terms of number of competitions, number of athletes coming here, number of, in terms of the logistics, in terms of... And they did it very well and they were successful. I'm sure that at that time they were saying, how is it possible that Qatar could host the Asian uh, Games in 2006? And we have seen since then, Qatar have been hosting many international events. Now we are talking about an um, average of, um, is it 50, 50, 52, 52 events. international Once events? A week. And they are happening. And uh, alhamdulillah, you know, things are, are happening. And I mean, <coughs> Qatar built the credibility as a host of those uh, international events. I agree with you. I mean, I, we need to, there's all, I mean, uh, even I think FIFA and uh, all the international sport organizations, when they are, you know, uh, offering uh, any nations to host the game, uh, any game, uh, mega events, they always look at different scenarios in terms of risks and, but uh, I think Qatar has been, since they, they won the bid, they have been learning as well from other experiences. Russia, we also, I mean, we were saying, I mean, thinking all, oh, Russia is going to, you know, what will happen in Russia with terrorism, Chechnya, all the conflicts, oh, yeah. and Russia, you know, the, you know uh, uh, so there have been also some negative, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I would say, um, you know, media around, you know. I, feel, I was going to say, I feel like that's a, media, a point against the media, right? Yes. Because we're always looking for something negative. I don't know if it's the media, but there was also a, 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 a sentiment about, ah, is Russia, you know, the, you know the, maybe it's going to be a hostile place to, uh, particularly, if, let's say, for Africans going to Russia, knowing about, you know, there have been many uh, reports about racism, but, you know, after all, then, you know, uh, it went very well. But I think, this is the thing, I mean, the, 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 the success of the, I mean, the host when they are hosting these mega events is not only their responsibility as well to make sure that they're, it's uh, running, you know. It's their stakeholders all coming, you know, working together. You know, you have the FIFA, you have other stakeholders. The sponsors, they don't want uh, the, the World Cup to, to be a failure. The FIFA don't want the, the national teams, you know. So they are all working together to make sure that uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, successful. And maybe that's why FIFA now, they're intervening somehow, you know, uh, you know in preparation for the World Cup in 2022 to first to sign this partnership with the... Uh, the, the host nation with Qatar, with the, Qatar, uh, with the Supreme Committee to be the partner, you know, in the uh, four years, you know. Uh, and also maybe they are thinking about this, uh, having the 48 uh, teams could be a way to reduce maybe the tensions and then bring those nations that maybe they want the World Cup to fail, bring them on board as a partners, not only as, uh, you, know, uh, you know, observers or 
So yeah, uh, maybe um, I, I will hope that it is going to be a success, you know. Uh. James Dorsey. Pablo, if I was accused of being, a, a, a being gloomy, I'm, I'm a starry-eyed <laughs> optimist compared to you. <laughs> no, seriously, it's, it's a legitimate question. But I think you've got to be cautious on several levels. First of all, if you take the period from winning the draft, of winning the, the bid, to uh, actually hosting the World Cup, we're two-thirds down the road. Mm -hmm. yes. The real overt public politicization of the Guttery World Cup started with the boycott. It was not, before that, you had two issues. You had those detractors of Qatar, primarily those who had lost the bid. Mm -hmm. And those arguments were really on, on legal issues, on the labor issues, human rights issues, what, what have you, uh, climate, and so on and so forth. They weren't, it wasn't the politicization of the... What you did have was what I have described as a covert war that was going on between the Emiratis and the Gutteries being played out through, uh, in the through, indirectly through the media and what have you. But it was not, and often those issues were not about football, mm -hmm. but they were about trying to um, uh, tarnish images, national images and whatever. The politicization's only started now. Mm -hmm. So, um, and by now, in some ways, the fact that there is the rift and, and God has come out of that rift in terms of its image not that badly. In fact, it's come out of it quite well. So I'm not sure that you would get that effect. I think the other issue is, and I'm not going to go into that in great detail, but there's a very complex relationship between uh, you know, certain segments of the Muslim community and their, their approach towards sports in general and, and football uh, and, and it's not just and, 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 there's, and that, that, that ambivalence and, and complex relationship goes all the way into the jihadi community so I think that you've you know it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to simply draw some, some simple one in one is two conclusions How much do you think that the covert war is happening in social media? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's playing a bigger role now, is it? Um, it's playing an important role, but it's also playing in the traditional media. Oh. You know, I mean, you know, and frankly, both the Gutteries and the, and the Emiratis were extremely clumsy at the beginning of this. Uh, uh, but uh, if you go, I mean, it goes back to companies that were founded with Emirati money uh, that were populated by very senior ex-officials of the U.S. Treasury who were, who were leveraging that in terms of the U.S. media, and they were doing very well on that. And, you know, Qatar hiring um, Tony Blair's former, uh, former spokesman and setting up a false blog that was then, uh, then discovered. So it was a very clumsy operation. Obviously now, it's pl a lot of it is playing out on, on, on social media, but I'm not, I'm, I, you know, in a lot of ways, social media has a lot of impact, but if you're trying to impact policy makers, it's still, depending on what, you know, what, if it's in the United States, it's still the Washington Post and the New York Times. And in London, it's The Guardian and whatever. I don't think it's social media. Okay, thank you. The gentleman in the hat there, please. Thank you. Ashif Siddiqui, a current affairs analyst. Uh, Professor Imadi, you mentioned, uh, you showed your concern, uh, corruption in the sports. The point is, when major tournaments and sports have become commercialized, and in capitalist society, these type of uh, things are an uh, integral part of the business. How you think that it can be controlled? I think, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, 
I think this been for a long time been rooted now in the sport, and 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 to solve it in in a uh, short run, I think it's very difficult. But as I said, the sport, all the sports, uh, we see it in the IOC in Olympics. The origin it comes from the West. Very rarely sports initiated in the Asia or in, in the Arab world. We don't have one single sport being introduced to the Olympics, you know, in the Arab world. Not even a single sport. So that's, you know, who brings the rules and the things. He controls the things. And uh, who, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, politics has the overhand over the sport. So who is leading the world in politics? Is it still the West? So they're going to apply the rules and force it on you. As long as there is no fairness, you know, just one side of things, this will happen. And uh, as, as not the government's now ruling anymore, the world, not even the sport. It's a multinational corporation. This is very obvious. And this is what we have a dilemma. It's all about money. They don't care. Now 1% of the war controlling 99% of the wealth everywhere. You see this poverty everywhere. It's, we have to think it as humanity, as even United Nations, when it comes not just to sports, to everything. Our dilemma, I may go shift a little bit to politics, the Palestinian problem. You know, I don't think anyone was thinking fairly that they don't deserve a country. And Israel didn't abide by even single, you know, regulation by United Nations, even just not even one. No one talks about them because they are who are backing them up is America and the West. Uh, you imagine just Gaddafi or anyone, Mali, Norega, a president of Panama, they you know, captured them from his country, took them to America. So this is a mob. A world is like a mob now, honestly. If we are thinking as human, as, as we are all you know, treating ourselves fairly, everyone should think it that way. When we're going to bring, when we're going to get rid of this greedy people, this multinational corporations, this I think will be the first step. Then we have to, to admit that uh, politics is penetrating in sports, and then we have to do something about it. New regulation, new issues, get rid of all these corrupted people <coughs> in, the, in the sports, in the, this sports organization. This is a, might be a way to a little bit solve the problem. Dr. Mara. And I would just say that, uh, I mean, it's not, I mean, even the international sport organizations are now you know, aware about all those issues in terms of making sure to protect their brand, you know, and uh, not to be associated with corruption. And we have seen now more, you know, like the IOC and the FIFA now, they, they are more, uh, you know, um, emphasizing the, all, all the values of governance and even the sponsors, you know, the first that, you know, uh, you know, the put pressure on FIFA to change its, you know, its governance, where also the sponsors were coming now to say, okay, this is where we have to protect our brand and we don't want to be associated with, you know, a corrupt, you know, organization. So it's not that, you know, uh, I would say that there, there are also the civil society, there are, you know, uh, uh, football associations, there are the spectators now, you know, organizing themselves to put pressure on the international sports systems to, to have a, a better uh, regulation in terms of fairness, in terms of equality, in terms of equity. We have seen also some good stories you know, of uh, you know, the women football players now in the, in the United States, in, in Norway, now they are going to get equal uh, salaries as their male. So it's not, you know, uh, there are some bright things are also happening in, in sports as well. James? I, I think the problem that you have is that you have two categories of corruption. You have the corruption that we're now all talking about, financial corruption and so on. But what enables that corruption is what I would describe as the political corruption of sports. And that has to do with, we've, and we've touched a, bit, a little bit on it, uh, it has to do with the relationship of sports and politics. And fact of the matter is, sports and politics are joined at the hip. They're CMEs twins and they cannot be separated. In fact, you look at Asia, which is to which this part of the world, the Middle East, belongs. It is the continent within world sports, and particularly within uh, football, that has the highest level 
of government control of, of national sports associations and particularly national football associations. So the question really is, if sports and politics are inextricably, inextricably intertwined, the solution is not a separation. The solution is also not what we have now, namely blanket denial by the international sports associations, which basically is a license to do whatever they want to do. The question is, is trying how, how do you figure out some sort of regulatory system, some sort of monitoring system, something you know, like you have an independent financial regulator or you have an independent water regulator in Britain, which is the only country in the world that has actually privatized water as the asset, that you have some sort of monitoring system, uh, some co sort of code that governs that relationship. You know, you recognize the relationship exists. How do you handle it? Thank you. Well, I think we've got time for just two more questions. The gentleman at the front has been waiting very patiently, and then uh, we'll take the gentleman there in the, in the black, in the third row. Oh, so first, this gentleman at the front, please. This one here, this gentleman, second from the middle. Yes. <laughs> we have until 7.30. <laughs> two more questions. Uh, just I would like to first start by uh, thanking uh, Brookings for uh, this important event because we used in Doha to attend politics. All gatherings and conferences are in politics. But now this is, I think, a new idea, a new an event which we are at least to transfer us from uh, politics, because politics in this region is boiling, always boiling. <laughs> However, um, I think, in my view, uh, politics should not be blamed, because there is politics in parts of the world where there is also sport going hand in hand with politics without any conflict. But the problem here in our area, in our, the Middle East, name it, that um, people involve politics in the sport, in the sport. and that's what actually uh, made the sport politicized. And, um, but for Qatar, I think, to, to organize the uh, World Cup, the next World Cup, I think I see it as breaking through of a mono monopoly, breaking the monopoly of having the World Cup in, in, in the West generally. That's one. Number two, I think I, I blame FIFA for politicizing the World Cup. And that politicization, in my view, when they added these um, extra teams and wanted in this area, which, I mean, um, there is a lot of problems, uh, the, 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 block, uh, the, block, the okay. blockade of Qatar, and still this um, uh, uh, Gulf crisis is continuing by suggesting, by bringing more teams and suggesting Kuwait and Oman, that I think will also uh, aggravate, it, 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 uh, I mean, it, it, it increase the problem because Kuwait is playing an important role for mediation. Oman is also, they are the only two countries which in this area that could make some kind of a hope. And involving them in, in this, Problem, it will create problems for them with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. And I think FIFA also has been very hasty in bringing these extra teams. There should be a plan of five, ten years for the future to think of it, but not after uh, Qatar had this, I mean, chance to organize the World Cup, and then the FIFA brings such ideas which are not helpful. Uh, 
There is another point which, if you allow me, I think the problem of the World Cup for Qatar in 2022, the problem is jealousy. Is jealousy because sport, sport is a tool for international relations, and Qatar is, a, is an open country. It started to be open to the world, and surprisingly, um, actually surprisingly, Qatar has been successful in a in a speed time or in a very short time, which. Um, the neighbors, unfortunately, instead of appreciating it, because it, as Qatar said, it's not Qatar organizing World Cup. It is the region. It is the region organizing it. So I think it's a matter of jealousy, but I think Qatar will um, overcome this problem. Thank you, and thank you, thank you, gentlemen, for the information you gave. And I think we enjoyed uh, taking ourselves out of politics. But unfortunately, FIFA <laughs> politicized this. Thank you very much, Thank sir. You. So we have time just for one more question from the gentleman there, just uh, two rows behind you. And then we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Khaled Ahroub. I teach uh, Middle Eastern politics and international relations at Northwestern University as well. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the co-hosting and the impact on the blockade and maybe kind of the possibility of changing this challenge into opportunity. Uh, I think pragmatically speaking and effectively speaking, this blockade and the Gulf crisis will come to an end at one point, either after one year or five years or 10 years, but eventually it will end. So the sooner the better. So instead of having this kind of confusion on the side of Qatar, what to do and whether we have uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, and then avoid the United Arab Emirates and other <coughs> Why not to change the policy into interact proactive, some sort of kind of benign offensive, if you like, that the policy of Qatar is to open up for co-hosting, and this is the co-hosting and the tournament for the, the willing, and whoever wants to, to join in, then they can, they can step in, of course, with certain kind of, with the big condition of ending the blockade. I know, I know this is, uh, there is a, an element of utopia maybe in this, mm -hmm. but I guess um, there is no harm in utopia. Uh, and then just kind of to cut a long story, maybe short in prolonging this blockade, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahl Mahdi. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. You know, I think the problem is Qatar just a few days ago, they said we wouldn't mind that our neighbors to host it. They announced it, Qatar, but the problem is with the UAE in particular. Already their officials mentioned that the only reason if we need to, to lift the blockade, let us host the World Cup with you. So now if it happens, if it happens and we're gonna lift it, then they didn't have any reason to obligate Qatar except for hosting the World Cup. And then I agree with the gentleman that says because of jealousy. So they will be in trouble now, UAE, even to accept. I mean, even they will tell them, come and do it. I, I don't think they will accept that, UAE, because they will contradict themselves now, Dr. Khalid. There's going to be a big, a big dilemma for UAE now. But I think, you know, my expectation, I don't know, it's from my heart. I think in 2021, the blockade will be left. <laughs> they force these countries by America, by the West. This is my expectation. 2021, everything will be left. It will go back to normal, not because they like it, they'll be forced. This is my expectation. Thank you. I could make the argument that uh, Qatar would benefit from make, take, being proactive and making the offer. Now, the two, in a sense, two groups of potential co-hosts. One is the Omanis and the Kuwaitis. It's obvious why they would, you know, the Omanis have been extremely helpful. The Kuwaitis are mediators and let them share and bask in the glory. It would be a smart move. You could also argue, if you wish, that it would be a smart move to say, you know, we'll co-host with the Emiratis and the, and, the, um, and the Saudis and put the shoe on the other foot. Because at the end of the day, you probably would get a rejection. 
I realize that there are people that argue that this whole boycott is about the, the, uh, uh, the, the World Cup, and I don't think it is. You know, so, and to the degree that it is, again, it's as a tool. It's not about the World Cup as such. The notion that this would solve problems, if the Emirates and Saudis were to accept, sure, because then you have to start talking about a lot of different issues. But the fact of the matter is, as with all the mediation efforts, you can take your horse to the trough, he's got to do the drinking himself. And neither the Saudis nor the Emiratis want to drink. And so I think really that the notion that the World Cup is going to be the, the icebreaker in this is, you said it, utopia. <laughs> I think that's a great point to finish on. Utopia, we have three, just over three more years to go before this World Cup. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I think it's been very entertaining and enlightening. And I think, uh, I hope you all share the view of the gentleman in the front there that we should be having more and more conversations about this, uh, this topic. Thank you very much, James Dorsey, Dr. Ahmed Al Mahdi, and Dr. Mahfoud Amara. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.